This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, this is Drinking With Author, the Literary Briefs Edition. I'm your host, Erica Lance. With me co-hosting today is... Mark Muncy from at eerieflorida.com. Awesome. And our guest today is the astounding, I'm using a different word, James Sutter. Woo! Thanks for having me. Okay, let's talk about what we're drinking, then I have a bunch of rapid fire questions. Mark, you're going to be impressed, but you're going to have to do a few. So I'm drinking flying embers hard kombucha, pineapple chili. I don't, I don't know who comes up with this stuff, but it's got a really pretty logo on it. I mean, How's the taste? It, it's, I mean, it's okay, so it tastes like kombucha. I don't know about you, like kombucha to me has like little nuances, but it tastes like kombucha every time I drink kombucha. You're not tasting that pineapple then. So. No, no, and not a lot of chili. I'm a spicy person. I thought it would be a little spicier. I was hoping for that back of the throat heat. And didn't happen anyway. Mark, what are you drinking? Uh, I am doing uh, some coffee tonight. I have got Ichabod's Dame Pumpkin Spice. It's the Coffee Shop of Horrors Halloween, uh, but they run it all year because we love Coffee Shop of Horrors. And yeah. uh, and uh, and I'm doing it iced, and it is crazy delicious. So I think it's hysterical. You're doing it iced in a coffee mug. You're not like doing it iced in a glass. You're doing it iced nope. in a coffee mug. It in the coffee mug but that's the only mug that's big enough to hold it you know so that's that's why i do that so you know. uh, i was in kind of a rush so i've just got my yuppie lime Lacroix here so a little fizzy water I love that you oh, good. okay rapid fire. I, know, I know what i am <laughs> okay rapid fire i don't what does that make me if i drink Lacroix? Anyway, no, <laughs> uh, a wannabe okay what is your favorite book of all time james I'm going to have to say uh, Hyperion by Dan Simmons, because I think it was probably the most influential on me in terms of my love of science fiction. You know, there's so many books that I love for different reasons, but Hyperion, with all of its different settings linked together, really blew my mind at a young age that I could, oh, you could have a novel that just puts everything in the same book. Very cool. What is your least favorite book of all time? I don't like to, uh, A, I don't like to dwell on books that I don't like, and B, I don't like to talk smack about any living authors because you never know who you're going to be, who you're going to become friends with later on. Um, but I will say, there's a lot of stuff I read in college that I was not a big fan of. A Confederacy of Dunces, I never got. That was one of those kind of like infinite jest where everybody was like, oh my God, it's so brilliant. And I was like, I don't get it. It's a dude farting a lot. Yep. Um, you say that. I'll tell you, everybody knows who listens to this podcast. Me and E.L. James will never be friends. Mm. Yeah, that will never happen. Okay. So um, what is your favorite book to movie or TV show? Book to movie or TV show? Um. Jurassic Park. Like I, I'm trying to think, is there has there ever been a better film adaptation than the than Jurassic Park? Like it was a book, it was my favorite book when I was in third grade. And then I saw the movie. And like, how many movies are legitimately better than the book? It's like Jurassic Park and Fight Club. And are there any others? True. I'm I'm a huge fan of Fight Club. I really am. And then I went and read the book after seeing the movie, and it was still just as brilliant. One of the few different ways ever that I didn't predict kind of the ending of it. Not that I'm like, oh my gosh, I predict the ending of books, but it was one of the few that I was like, when he goes, we've just lost cabin pressure. I was like, what in the crap sake is happening? I loved it. I I loved I loved Fight Club. Like the actors in that are amazing. Oh, and I also uh, will just throw a shout out because that uh, that ending scene introduced me to the Pixies, which was its own whole musical awakening. So uh, I got to give it props for that. Very cool, Mark. Hmm? Rapid fire questions. Oh, oh, my questions. That's right. All right. So, um, you know, you're a fan, science fiction fan, fantasy fan. 
uh you just mentioned dan simmons uh that's great uh what is like the ultimate universe for you to play uh, to, to read about like uh, you know what is your favorite you know which science fiction genre blew your mind who do i just always uh come back to yeah. um i'm so bad at picking favorites um recently uh i find the expanse to be just delightful but um but that's that's so recent i feel like um it's got to be something from my childhood if it's going to be the ultimate you know what i'm going to give another shout out to patricia reed's enchanted forest chronicles because i just can't ever get enough of that feeling of like oh this is this is fun and happy and just it's it's going home okay so you're what's your favorite comic book oh okay. oh um ooh, that's hard maybe uh maybe lucifer maybe wicked and the divine mm. maybe uh i mean saga saga is just gorgeous and fun um actually the unwritten is the comic that and lucifer are what got me back into reading comics because i'd read comics as a kid and then sort of fallen off it and then uh my wife was working on the Kindle team when they started trying to uh, bring in comics onto the uh, the Kindle tablets. And uh, so she was like, oh, you should check this out. And it was The Unwritten um, by uh, Mike Carey and Peter Gross, I believe. And uh, that just, it blew my mind and woke me back up to that that world of creator-owned comics that were very, you know, the, the everybody knows Sandman and Watchmen, but I feel like we're in this real renaissance where you know everything Brian Vaughn does, everything uh, the Wicked and Divine people do. You know, you've got you've got Bitch Planet, you've got all these different yes. comics that are just. It's a great time for comics right now. Very much. What about you, Mark? What is your favorite comic? Uh, right now, I still got to go with the Goon. I love Eric Powell. Uh, he just does incredible art every freaking up issue and it's just big dumb guy fighting monsters and it's just and it's hysterical it's got it's been 20 years now independent and just incredible if you haven't read it pick it up so good i'll have to check that out oh yeah my favorite comic is lady death mm. that's a good one i love lady death that is the good well thank you for displaying that particular thing always handy uh, what is as a writer what is your Achilles heel? What is the thing that you do as a writer that your editors are like, stop doing that? Oh, that my editor, I was, when you say Achilles heel, I was gonna be like, uh, despair? Um, like, <laughs> not <laughs> the the inability to actually outline the book and get it written? Like, um, but no, if we're talking, once there's a manuscript, uh, that's much easier to identify. Um, I. God, what do I do? Generally, as soon as somebody tells me about them, I work really hard to not do them. Um, I probably, I know that when I'm speaking normally, I say the, I write the word definitely far too often. So that's probably shows up in my, in my writing as well. Um, I don't know. I'm going to need, I'm going to need to have an editor tell me. No, it's, it's I think we learn from them, but in like, it's when I talk to authors, it's always interesting, especially my author friends, to go, what is the newest thing that you're doing? Because yeah. to your point, we get told, and even if you put post-its going, don't say the word that 5,000 times. Search the word that as you're writing, um, or shrugging, or winking, or furrowing the brow, uh... you know, like those kind of things over and over nodding that's all they're it's, doing in the book everybody's nodding it's it's gritting teeth and clenching jaws for me everybody like that's which is totally a comic book you know like yeah. 80s fantasy thing everybody's just clenching their jaw it's a dental nightmare in my novels <laughs> <laughs> what about as a reader what is the thing that drives you most crazy as a reader when you read people doing it <sighs> Honestly, the things that drive me nuts are less at the language level usually and more at the meta level of just cardboard characters or 
Um, I mean, that's that's usually what gets me is all somebody will be like, oh, my God, you got to read this fantasy novel. Like, it's so good. Like, the world building is incredible, et cetera. And then I'll get in there and the characters will just be so one dimensional or like they all have the whole every book has epic fantasy voice. Right. Where you're like, there's yeah. this is so generic, like it's all everything is from 10,000 feet or else, uh, you know, a very like fairy tale you know, in the beginning kind of story. Whereas I want to be in the character, in the voice. I want to, you know, a close, and not, not like I can't appreciate, you know, omniscient narrators or whatever, but I want a really strong voice. And so when somebody's super detached and it's all, you know, I loved, to be clear, I loved Robert Jordan when I was a kid. I thought it was amazing. I have respect. Uh, but my wife has been listening to his books on uh, on audiobook, and so as I walk through, there have been times where I'm just like, God, the the tone of this is so flat to me now. Yeah. And I only feel okay casting those aspersions because he's wildly successful and dead. Um, so you know, it's it's interesting because I will say um, one of the things. Um, because that's sort of truth. That's what we're talking about, right? Sort of truth theory. He has one of the best. Oh, uh, of time. Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time. I'm funny. Yeah. Actually, I played that role playing game. Yeah. And a friend of mine broke the hair and blade in it by fumbling three times <laughs> in a row. And I was like, you don't get anything cool anymore handed to you. Just, I don't know how you did that. Um, let's, let's talk for a moment about characters. So you, you played games what is your favorite kind of character to play oh i like non-optimized characters i'm that guy you know i'm always the uh the wizard with the sword or you know the thief that runs out in front like i'm really uh i'm not a good min maxer by nature and so i really like funny characters characters that are a little bit absurd characters that have a a shtick to them like one of my favorite characters i ever played was uh this uh wizard called uh named artemis craw tengu folk hero he made sure everybody knew that he was a tengu folk hero um and he would run around with us with a sword just because he thought it looked awesome um you know he wasn't particularly good with it but it fit his narrative of himself as like the robin hood of the crow people um and yeah like the, the character that runs around screaming a lot is uh usually my favorite my favorite character i ever played was a squash buckler that had a seven wisdom and she thought everybody should know who she was. Like she just mm. introduced herself no matter what enemy, it could just be a creature and she would still introduce herself and ask them to surrender. It didn't matter what it was. She had a seven wisdom, no common sense. It was pretty awesome. I loved playing it. And then I think she had a 10 intelligence. Like, okay, but with that seven wisdom, it was one of my favorite characters to play because you know, when you, when you have that part where you can, um, you know, play to the deficiency of the character, I think is really awesome versus like, I have eight teams all the way across the board. I, I feel like every role-playing game that I'm in, like there is a place for dark drama, you know, really tense situations in a horror campaign or whatever. But most of the time I treat, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and stuff as kind of like, 80s action movie comedy where you know there's stuff blowing up but it's it's funny it's slapstick you know in my current game one of my players is uh it's a starfinder game and she's playing an otter marriage counselor a sentient otter who is a marriage counselor and that's her character and like they're running through dungeons and she's a marriage counselor and it's it's hilarious like she convinces all these people to work through their emotional problems instead of fighting and uh i just i appreciate that kind of zaniness let's get her to ravenloft that'd be exciting right right yeah so she actually she actually worked on the new ravenloft book i believe oh, like she's she's an editor at wizards of the coast oh <laughs> right. my goodness nice nice, no. nice. i hate ravenloft ravenloft is the bane of my existence <laughs> I have had zero successful encounters with Ravenloft. Zero. Not even two gaming sessions. Okay, Mark, over to you. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. So, um, all right, so we've done favorite uh, favorite superhero. Oh. <sighs> That's interesting. 
Um, I guess it's probably... I'm going to say it's either Sandman because it facilitated a whole new style of comics um, in the mainstream uh, or maybe Squirrel Girl. I think uh, I think Ryan North is a genius um, and like every everybody who works on that book, uh, it's funny. It's um, but I, yeah, I, I think that just for the Twitters. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so good. That's fantastic. No, I can't argue that. Okay, so you've got that. All right, then let's go. If you could meet any character, fictional, uh, throughout history, and have like just a sit down with them, who would it be? Um. Uh, sorry. Uh, fictional, fictional or real? Uh, fictional. We can do either. We can do either. Oh God. Um. I mean, I guess the. The the smart answer, if it's a real person, is uh, probably Jesus, just to like get out a camera, film it, and get some things settled for the record, because there are a lot of problems that could probably be solved with a, a good press release, um, <laughs> but or a good press conference. But that's that's a little bit cheating. So, uh, man, who do I just adore? Oh, this is so hard. Um, <laughs> like, I know the worlds that I want to go to, but picking an individual character. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to pick one at random and say, uh, I want to hang out with uh, Mabel from Gravity Falls. Hey, yeah. As a grunkle, I approve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have two uh, grand nieces and nephews, so I've, I and I'm the creepy guy in Florida with the weird house, so they love me. So they they watch Gravity Falls all the time. I approve. Nice. Wow, that that escalated right there. Okay, I got a question for you because you're friends with Dan Wells. I am. Yes, and he started doing professional GMing. He did. I was talking to him uh, through that whole process. Have you ever thought about doing? You literally have the experience. Like, if we wanted to put, I am experienced at the top of James Sutter, we could do you know, that. You know, I, to a certain extent, I do that in that whenever I'm a guest of honor at a convention, you know, I try to offer at least a game, you know, either games for the uh, attendees, you know, sometimes there'll be like a raffle or something, um, or a game for the people who put it together. You know, because oftentimes the behind the scenes staff uh, are working really hard. And so it's nice to be able to give them a you know couple hour one shot. Um, but, you know, I don't generally do that um, for a couple of reasons. One of them is just that, like, I love running games, but I also find it kind of exhausting. Um, another reason is there's always that uh, that question of I'm somebody who likes to run a little bit rules light. Like I play kind of fast and loose. And not everyone is cool with that. Um, and so <laughs> at a convention or something, I always have to preface with people by saying like, hey, I play kind of fast and loose. Also, if it's a game that I worked on, there might be seven different versions of a given rule in my head. And I don't remember which one we put in the book. <laughs> so you might know the game better than I do. Um, but then the big thing is actually... Uh, so I've got a medical condition called muscle tension dysphonia, where it's really easy for me to lose my voice. Um, and so oftentimes, especially at a convention or something, uh, I have to be really careful or my muscles will essentially choke off my vocal cords. Um, so for instance, like, you know, we're doing a couple hours interview right now. That's like all my talking for the day. After oh, wow. that, I'll just kind of be quiet, um, which is a shame because as you can tell, I love talking and I love hearing myself talk. So I'm a big fan of that myself. I do understand. <laughs> okay, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you is about meeting fans. Mm. Right? Because that's always interesting. So what is your weirdest fan encounter? Weirdest fan encounter. Oh. Um, well, here's a weird one that happened online um, that is 
weird, but in a way that I love um, okay. is the, so uh, weird in a non shamey way. Uh, I had, uh, when I wrote that book, um, I think it was the distant worlds book. Um, there was a fan that was super excited for it to come out like really, really excited. Um, and had been waiting on the message boards for a long time. And everybody kind of knew like, oh, you know, user Mikazi is very excited about this book. And then when it came out, he wrote like slash fiction about the book. Like, like it's like him lying in his bedroom and like the window opens and the blinds flutter out and like, there it is, my book. And it like, and distant worlds enters the room and takes him in his arms and it's like whispering in his ear. Yeah. And it was, it was amazing. Everybody in the office was like, this is like the weirdest, most delightful tribute like, we've ever gotten. Stuff, man, that's awesome. But, but we've also, you know, uh, on the flip side, you know, everybody's had weird fan interactions. We used to get a lot of mail um, from prisoners that sometimes had some very uh, fascinating pornography or um, somebody, uh, somebody sent us some dice that they'd made out of uh, uh, toilet paper that they'd chewed into like paper mache. Like, and they told us in the letter, like, this is the same way you make a shiv. I made you some dice. So it's like, oh, thank you for chewing this toilet paper into pulp and like assembling it like a... That is terrifying. Yeah, but but again, right, like this, the thing that I always try to remember um, is that like, for the most part, you know, occasionally you'll get really jerky fans, but for the most part, even the the awkward encounter is like, hi, I I chewed this with my mouth, please accept it. Um, it's it's done out of love like they love the thing that they that you made they want to talk to you about it um and so i feel like well of course like caveat you never need to put up with bad behavior just because you're a creator you don't owe fans your time if somebody's being a jerk if somebody's being a creeper like get away get help don't be afraid to call them on it um but uh you know there are a lot of people on varying levels of uh, social adroitness. And ultimately, if somebody's being awkward but harmless and just like loves your game, I try to really take it as the compliment that it is. I love that. What about, um, you know, I think for all of us, that first encounter we have where somebody fangirl or fanboy or fan non binary reacts to us what was that like for you the first time somebody recognized you and did that mm -hmm. moment where they were just like you made their entire universe by being in front of them i mean those those are always really great but i remember the one i remember really uh distinctly was there was a gen con where it was super late because you just when you're at gen con you just work the whole time you know it's one of those like 8 a.m till 2 a.m kind of things um and so it was after hours, I was exhausted. And I was like a mile away from the convention at this point, just somewhere in Indianapolis at a restaurant, just trying to get a bite to eat. Um, and so I ordered some food and like went to pay and the bartender's like, oh no, it's uh, it's already handled. I'm like, what? There's nobody here. And he was like, yeah, that uh, that couple down at the, uh, the end of the bar over there, like they paid for your meal. Um, and I was like, that's weird. And so I walked over and was like, hi and they were like hey yeah um we just we love pathfinder and we recognized you and just wanted to say thanks and that was that was a real like my head exploded on that one the idea that they would have just recognized my face not even like the book uh was fascinating so i felt i felt like pretty hot shit <laughs> that is freaking awesome oh my god i love that story so much i think you know, we t I talk about fans a lot on the show because I always want fans, obviously, you know, being awkward or being negative or whatever to a creator of any kind is not great, right? Um, but I think some fans don't even realize how much it is important to us to see the impact on the fans for our work, yeah. right? And, and have them interact with us and you know, I, I, I often ask the authors, has anybody ever um, cosplayed as one of your characters? Have you had somebody cosplay as one of the characters that you've written? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, there's a ton of cosplay for Pathfinder. And so there's been 
you know, having worked on like the iconic characters, which are the ones that show up again and again in the art for the books. Um, yeah, you see those constantly. Um, and that's always really fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, it becomes, it never stops being delightful, especially because a lot of people's cosplay is really, really good. Oh yeah. You know, you know, another, I have to tell you the other fan interaction that sticks out in my mind, the, the ones that stick out in my mind are always the ones that happen out of context. Like it's lovely when somebody recognizes you at the, at the booth or at the signing or whatever, but when it happens out in normal life, uh, that's that's when it really hits you. And I had one where a friend of mine, um, uh, my friend Jay Kristoff, who's a young adult author, uh, who's wildly popular, um, he came to town and so I was gonna take him out to dinner afterwards. And so I've just, we have just left his signing where it was seriously three hours of just an enormous line of person after person losing their marbles over how much they love this guy. Um, which is warranted because he's fabulous. He's one of my favorite YA authors. Um, but so we finally, we fi I finally drag him away from like the screaming hordes um, and we're at a diner just hanging out and talking about the industry or whatever. And the waiter kind of comes by and is like, hey, are you talking about, are you talking about Pathfinder? And, and he was like, we were like, yeah. And he was like, I'm a huge Pathfinder fan. And Jay, you know, sort of smiles and is like, well, you know, James Berg is one of the creators of Pathfinder and the fan loses his shit. Um, and it was just so delightful because here I am sitting with somebody who is orders of magnitude more famous than I am or have any hope of being. But like in this one moment, <laughs> like this one found me. And so we were both just laughing about it. It was really, it was really fun. That is amazing. Okay, Mark, I'm going to give you the final question before we have to wrap up here. Final question. All right. No pressure, but it better be good. Very good. Most influential author on your work? Okay, so Dan Simmons would be the go-to, but I already mentioned Dan Simmons. Um, so I'm going to mention another with a caveat which is uh, Joel Rosenberg. So there was a series in, I think the eighties called uh, Guardians of the Flame. Oh. Um, and this, <laughs> this is one where I go back and like having gone back in recent years and checked it out, I go, oh my God, like everything about, like there's a lot of cringe in here. Like there's a lot, well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, um, and th this is actually one that I often bring up when people ask about like, what are your problematic faves? Um, like that's, that series is it for me. Um, and I haven't read them since I was a child. So, uh, but I know thinking back, it's like, oh yeah, there sure was a lot of like rape and objectification and things in there that I would not normally recommend now. Um, but there was one particular scene where I remember the language it was the first time I'd ever encountered somebody using like line breaks and repetition to create a sense of like an advancing like heartbeat where it's just, you know, but ump, but ump, but ump. And like, and it amped up the tension and it created this incredible effect where, you know, like the last couple of lines, um, you know, it's, it's as this character, the barbarian character is starting to rage. Um, and it's the first time in the book that he's ever gone berserk like that. And they're trying to show what that experience is like. And it's just him going through these rough memories of his, uh, of his past interspersed with like this building rage and that a B structure where it was almost like poetry. It, it made this huge impact on me. And it's something that I still see myself doing all the time. Um, you know, where I really like that treating it like, um, like percussion, using the the writing and the line breaks and the formatting as music, um, and so I I love that. Even the and even if I look back and go, "Ooh, this this book was maybe maybe a hot mess." Like you can learn a lot from a hot mess, yeah. and so it's I feel like it's important to sort of acknowledge uh, acknowledge what I got from that, and I you know and do something else with it. Yep.
hundred percent. Yeah, I tried to go back and reread that a couple years ago, and was like, "What? What? What? I don't remember this." <laughs> that actually, that actually was what made me. I now have a sort of rule of thumb for myself where I won't recommend any book that I haven't read in like the last five years, just because I'm not gonna remember like the quality or the content. You know, I I did the thing where I bought my little brother a whole bunch of books that I'd loved when I was younger. And some of them, he was like, why did you get me this? This was garbage. <laughs> it's like, yes, but it was garbage that was very important to me. Yeah. You like, will this garbage and how it influenced you the way it influenced me. Yeah. The whole point of Princess Bride where oh, you realized his dad was just reading him the good parts. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. In the book, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. Well, and that's actually, that ties into the whole idea of, you know, people talk about like the classics in a, in a genre. And I think the thing that folks forget is the things that were super influential on you, uh, you know, 40, 30, 20 years ago, uh, there will be other books coming out now that have that same effect and serve the same function for the people who are coming up now. So it's not that the fantasy fans who are 20 years old now need to be reading Heinlein. They need to be reading what's coming out now that does for them what Heinlein did for you. So... Look at how poetic you were just at the end of this podcast. That is <laughs> well, okay. Stay sober. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> scene, mic drop. Okay, James, how do people find you? Uh, you can find me. I'm all, always on Twitter for better and worse at uh, just at James L. Sutter. And you can also find me on my website at jameslsutter.com. And that's where I post about, I teach a lot of classes. So you can usually find me there um, or just, Drop me a drop me a DM, drop me a tweet. Yay. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. You've been so thoroughly entertaining. It's amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so I've been Eric Lambs. And I've been Mark Muncy from at Erie, Florida. And our guest has been James Sutter, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.